Hi everyone, it's Lynn Boutier from lynnboutier.com. I'm a certified trauma recovery coach and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of my ongoing series entitled Monogamous 13. This is my ongoing series where I speak about my own trauma from two perspectives. One is the certified trauma recovery coach and one is the trauma and abuse survivor. And I feel that this has value for my viewers because I can take little pieces of my experience with trauma and abuse and I do pause to say that all abuse is traumatic. And um, I take just little little incidents and aspects of uh, what has happened in my life and what I've experienced in both realms and what I call it and them trauma, meaning some of the trauma that I have comes from people and their behaviors. And some of it comes from incidents, environments, situations, circumstances, um, with, you know, weather events and out of control things that have nothing to do with being caused by any individual or group. So when I say it or them trauma, that's what I'm referring to. I just make it very simple because technically they're referred to as interpersonal traumas and environmental traumas, but I just shorten it to, to them and it trauma. So when we have these discussions, when I'm here with you and I'm clarifying some points, so that you can have clarity in your situation. It gives me great joy to do it. And I really appreciate you being here. If you have been coming back to my channel and you find value here, please don't forget to like the videos, um, share my channel on whatever platform you want, um, put comments in the comment section, hit the notification bell. And anytime you want to have a um, discussion with, um, well, uh, what I'm saying awkwardly is, if there's a topic that you want me to cover so that I make a video and then the topic, the, the, so that the discussion can happen in the comments, I would be delighted to do that. So you can always put a, a question or uh, a request for a video on a certain topic in the comments and I welcome those. And then when, when I have made the video, I will come back into those comments and let you know the title of the video and that it's up and it's, um, it's viewable for you on YouTube now. So um, thank you so much for being here. This is special episode number 149 of Monogamous at 13. And yesterday I did start a, a new category on YouTube, which is um, a, a new series entitled Catching my Fe Myself Feeling Good. And um, I've only made two videos so far for that category, but there will be lots more and I'll try to make one each day. So Today's topic is a bit of an elaboration on yesterday's topic. And yesterday I spoke about two sneaky ways that an abuser uses language. And, um, you know, the, the rest of the sentence would be to harm you or to confuse you or to make it so that they don't have to take any uh, responsibility or, or accountability for what they do and say. And so that they never have to face consequences. An abuser, it, consequences are kryptonite to them. They literally cannot tolerate having any consequences for anything that they do. They want any consequences that ever happen to be on you or any other person that they abuse because it's part of the nature of an, observe, uh, of, of an abuser. They literally cannot handle anything coming back on them. And so um, I had a really excellent domestic violence counselor, all of them that I've been to, I've been to three separate domestic violence counseling and support groups. And each one of them had a counselor who reiterated the same point, all abusers lie. And some of the ways that they lie aren't really huge and overwhelming and direct for some of them. Most of them, I would think that they are. The, um, the person that I was in relationship with that was highly abusive with me um, and a few other people, I might add, um, that person most definitely did not want to have anything come back on them for what they did. And they found fault always with the abused. If I do this to you, it's essentially your fault. <laughs> Uh, if you abuse me, um, I, I can construe anything that you do as abuse towards me. And this is the, the, the abuser speaking. 
but anything that I do to anybody else is never abuse. And that's just what, you know, that's what they've got going on inside their own unique universe. That is one of their core beliefs. Everyone abuses me. I abuse no one. I have never abused anybody in my life. You might not like what I do, but this is a, an expression I heard many, many times before. It doesn't rise to the level of abuse. What I did might have been wrong, but it doesn't rise to the level of abuse. So today, um, I wanted to speak about the invalidation practices that they that they use, um, the behaviors of invalidation. And a lot of times it can sound like um, things that if someone's ears aren't tuned to the language of abuse and you're in a public place or, you know, you're in a group, a gathering of people, whether it's, you know, your friends, you might be at a friend's wedding or you might be at a, at a, a, a funeral or a wake, you might be at a funeral breakfast. Um, you might be at, um, you know, in the, in the, uh, what do you call it? In, in the lobby of a lovely theater during intermission. And they're going to say something that anybody standing next to you is not going to hear as in any way abusive, but your ears will hear it as abusive because you know that they can disguise things when they're out in public. And so you will get it loud and clear that they are invalidating you, but a person standing next to you wouldn't. And so they, they really kind of seem to need to have this, this secretiveness and the um, the cloak and dagger kind of stuff where I'm doing this to you and I'm getting away with it because nobody else knows what I'm doing. And it makes them feel very, very emboldened and empowered. And the whole goal of being an abuser in a nutshell is to make you feel unempowered. Because what do they want? Power and control. Whose are they taking? Yours. That's what the whole thing is about, right? I want to I want to feel powerful and I'm going to usurp your power or I'm going to siphon off your power and I'm going to snork it up because to me your power is food. And so I'm going to give you some language today about abuser invalidation. And the way they invalidate you is because they want you to never forget in any, I mean, in virtually any circumstance you could ever find yourself in with them. Even just going out to a movie, when you're in, oh, excuse me for just a moment. So sorry to delay. Sometimes when I make a video in the morning, I forget. to um, turn off my alarm. I was up before my alarm went off today. And then if I just if I just hit it with my finger, it'll come back in a couple minutes and drive us crazy. So I'm so sorry for the interruption. All right, so, so the language of an abuser is, I'm going to invalidate you in as many places and in ma as many ways as I can possibly do. Well, first, I have an, ar an article pulled up for you before we go further into the discussion and I'll give examples of the invalidation and what it can look like because it isn't always clobbering you over the head with invalidation. Sometimes it can be subtle invalidation and all of it, your nervous system receive whether it's clobbering you over the head with it or whether it's subtle, your nervous system still detects it and your nervous system is still affected by it. And what I mean by affected by it is that when we are experiencing invalidation it is verbal emotional and psychological abuse um i don't differentiate between let me rephrase that i don't describe abuse the same way that a lot of other people describe abuse um there are people who like to inform other people on on youtube and on other platforms about um tactics of abusers but and that's great. I'm so glad that they're doing that. And, and I don't criticize other um, content creators. I just simply don't. There's room for all of us. And every single person has their own perspective. And it's welcome in the world. There's enough room for everybody. And um, 
I feel that there's no need for criticism of other content creators. It's just not necessary and it's inappropriate. But what I will say is you'll find a difference in viewpoint where some people say there is emotional abuse, there's psychological abuse, there's verbal abuse. But I'm not hearing too many that say this tactic is all three bundled into one. And that's the way I look at many of the tactics that are used by an abuser, that they're verbal, emotional, psychological abuse. Picture it like a three-sided object. Okay, it's just a three-sided object. It's a triangle. And one action on their part can be like this, okay? Verbal, emotional, psychological abuse. It's a three-sided object. And so what, what does that teach us? What does that give us? It gives us a little bit richer understanding that they're not only doing one thing to us. This is the point that I'm making. It is complex. They are not doing just some vague little offhanded thing. If it has three separate types of abuse rolled into one in an action that they're doing, that is a complex action. And it's, it is going to have an impact on your nervous system. It had a huge impact on my nervous system for years and years. Started when I was, when I met this person when I was 12 and then was with them from age 13 as an intimate partner all the way up to age 40, uh, excuse me, for 45 years. I stayed, I stayed in that relationship to age 58. So it's 45 years that I was with them. And um, this is how you learn the language of an abuser by being involved in it. And it doesn't have to be such a long relationship as mine. You can be in a relationship with somebody for three months and be absolutely exposed to some of the worst abuse that you've ever experienced. So I do not differentiate and say that the longevity of the relationship is how you judge whether or not the behaviors were severe. No, no, it has to do with whether or not the behaviors were severe and nothing else, okay? I just happened to be in it for a long time. But let's go back to the concept of invalidation. I pulled up an article here that will, um, it, it's a really beautiful article, beautifully written. And, um, and it's from uh, Start With Self, dot com dot au this is from australia obviously and um the question is um and i don't see anything here to credit it might be at the end of the article where it gets credited but i don't um i don't see that okay let's start with self from australia says, how do narcissists invalidate you and what to do about it? Narcissists use a number of manipulation tactics to erase your identity and get your total submission. Out of all these tactics, emotional invalidation is particularly cruel and insidious. What is emotional, in, excuse me, what is emotional validation and why do we all need it? As humans, we all have a deep-seated desire to be accepted. Regardless of our race, gender, or age, we all want to feel seen and heard. We want to connect to other human beings. This feeling of connection makes us feel that we belong. These emotional needs are as essential as our survival needs, like the need for food or water. This is extremely true. When we are validated, we feel that we matter. We feel that there is a place in the world for us with our own unique talents, interests, and personality traits. When we feel validated, we feel that our thoughts and emotions matter. We feel accepted. Emotional validation is at the very core of healthy relationships, personal and professional ones as well. What is emotional invalidation? Emotional invalidation is the exact opposite. People who invalidate you state that your emotions, thoughts, and experiences are not worth even noticing. Such emotional abuse is extremely hurtful and debilitating to the human psyche. Not only do you lack emotional safety, but you also feel worthless and almost invisible. Gradually, you even start doubting your sanity. That's very, very true. Invalidation comes from the lack of empathy, and lack of empathy is one of the main traits of narcissism. If you are not sure if you are suffering from this emotional abuse, 
read the below example and ask yourself if it sounds familiar. So here's the example they give. You are in a group of people and suddenly your partner makes a comment suggesting that you put on weight. It is an awkward moment. You know that you had put on weight a bit and your partner also knows that. You would never expect anyone to make this comment in public though. You are not sure what to say. Seconds pass and your partner starts laughing and says that they were only joking. Later in the evening, you are trying to have a conversation about this and explain to them that that was not nice. You felt embarrassed and hurt by their comment. Unfortunately, your partner has no intention of discussing the situation and your feelings. All they have to say is, I was only joking. You're overreacting as always. You feel that there is no space for you to express your feelings. The other person doesn't seem to care to listen to you and to understand how their words or actions made you feel. You are, you are left feeling invisible and hurt. Why do narcissists invalidate people? And all abusers are narcissists. I just want to interject that. We don't have to call an abuser a narcissistic abuser because every single action that they do against you and other people, if they are a true abuser, is automatically narcissistic. They are all, they all have the quality of narcissism. Every abuser does. You couldn't abuse another person without having a lack of empathy. And that is one of the hallmarks of narcissism is the lack of empathy. <clears throat> Narcissists are deeply insecure people who cover their fragile ego behind a thick mask of confidence, arrogance, and entitlement. They need to protect themselves from seeing their true self makes them obsessed with hiding behind that mask. This mask is their safe place. It is their illusion and delusion that they are perfect. Anyone or anything that is perceived as a threat to their safety automatically becomes their enemy. Their existence is fueled by their con constant obsession to protect their make-believe world of illusions. As Maggie from Narquise says, this result in the fixation, this results in the fixation to constantly source supply. For the narcissist, this is their validation. Unlike emotionally healthy people, however, the pathological narcissist's version of validation is not contingent on acceptance and understanding. Letting things and people be without the need to change them is not something the, nar the narc can do. Rather, validation, and by this I mean valid validating them, your needs are completely irrelevant to them, is all about controlling and manipulating you into giving them the hit of supply they constantly crave. Because supply is needed for their survival, they will score it at any cost. The hunt for validation is an obsession for the narcissist. Therefore, the narcissist's validation becomes your val in their validation becomes your invalidation. They're trying so hard to validate their existence, their point of view, their reason for being, all of that that they have to knock down your validation, meaning they'll invalidate you in order to get some supply so they can fortify their own validation. Um, what strategies do narcissists use to invalidate you? Well, there's, I'm just, I'm not gonna define each one. They're pretty self-explanatory, but gaslighting, denial, taking no responsibility, and uh, what emotional invalidation might sound like, you are overreacting. Just let it go. You shouldn't be so angry. It could be much worse, you know. Stop making things up. I have never said that or done that. It's all in your imagination. You are too sensitive. It was just a joke. No one else is bothered by this, only you. Just so just stop it. So there's, there's more to the article about invalidation, but um, down at the bottom, it says, how can you handle invalidation? And it has these um, little paragraphs. I'll just read you the titles of the paragraphs because I don't want to take a long time reading the article. You can find the article at the end. I'll remind you where you can find it. So number one is stay calm. Number two is validate yourself. Number three is surround yourself with supportive people. And... So um, this 
at the bottom. I cannot see. I, I just can't find an, um, anything here that credits this article to an individual. But if you want to read the whole thing, it's quite a good article. It's called, it's at uh, the website startwithself.com AU. Excuse me. Startwithself.com.au. And the article is entitled, How Do Narcissists Invalidate You and What to Do About It? All right. So the ways that they invalidate you um, are not just what's in that article. There's a whole lot more. But essentially, it's all doing the same thing. It is making you feel inferior to them. It's making you feel like you're invisible. It makes you feel like um, you're exhausted. It makes you feel like you're constantly on your back foot and trying to um, defend your point of view, uh, defend your words, defend your actions, and defend your existence. And trying to reestablish the truth because... Invalidation is often, as the article says, it's often done by challenging what you say. I'll give you an example. Um, I've used this example before, but it's really, it's a very fitting example. Um, it was my daughter's birthday party and we had neighbors and relatives at the house. You know, we were friendly with our neighbors and um, it was indoors. It was winter time when we were having this little birthday party. And we had pizza and chicken wings and birthday cake. And I know it's not the healthiest things to offer for a dinner at your house, but that's what it was. Pizza, chicken wings, and birthday cake and um, cake and ice cream. So, um, but that's what it was. And it was traditional. There were people in, in our neighborhood that were doing the exact same thing, the exact same dinner. Um, it's in, in upstate New York. That is a birthday party dinner where if kids are coming to the party or adults are coming to the party, um, it's okay. We just consider it okay to take the day off from nutrition for one day. <laughs> um, but anyways, we do that and, um, that's what we were doing then. And so when well, we're having this little party and I'm in the kitchen and I'm either serving pizza or birthday cake, I'm not sure which it was, but we had a kitchen island and I had the, you know, the plates set up and the boxes were open and I had the tongs and, and I'm just, you know, people are kind of coming through with their plate and pointing to what they want because there were different types of pizza and a couple different types of wings. And, you know, the stuff was out and they're just making their plates and going to where they're going to sit down and eat. And um, I was telling a story. Um, so a couple, somebody had asked me a question and um, my my dad had been sick. He had been recently diagnosed with a, a very serious illness, and um, and so <laughs> somebody asked me, "Oh, how's your dad?" And I started talking about it just for a couple minutes, and and my husband just as clear as could be stopped that party, brought it to an absolute standstill, still by saying to me, "Hey, Lynn, this is a birthday party." Nobody wants to hear about your sick dad. That's a real downer. And it was just a total invalidation of, I mean, somebody asked me, my dad had just recently, like really newly diagnosed with lung cancer. <laughs> and I, I was asked, answering that question and I'm already emotional because, and I'm not saying like at that party, I wasn't, I wasn't like devastated and crying or anything like that. But for a few weeks, I had been especially emotional because I knew that my dad had approximately a five-year window to be alive. And when this was happening, um, it was just, you just don't say that to somebody who's losing a parent when you know that that parent is, is already, you know, um, how should I say it, um, comorbid with other illnesses. And then they get a diagnosis like that. And I, I had worked in healthcare before that, you know, earlier on in my life. And I understand that a lot of progress has been made in treatment of such illnesses, but I wasn't in denial that that was going to happen. So I was talking about kind of making my peace with it. 
you know, and it was just, I wasn't like, oh, I'm so upset. It's so awful. And there's nothing wrong with, with emote, emoting. Our emotions are not bad. They're not bad or wrong. And we can express them whenever we want to. But I was at a party and my spouse had to make everyone feel cringe for a minute by just slamming me down verbally, emotionally, and psychologically with just one sentence. Hey, Lynn, you're at a party and nobody wants to hear about this. You're a real downer. And how do you recover from that? And then let's go fast forward through the party because there's a silence. Everyone feels awkward. It doesn't happen just to the person who was the target. This happened to every single person who was present, who was aware and heard it and knew what it was. Some of the older kids, I'm sure, felt a little uncomfortable. The kids who were like maybe heading towards their teens might have been aware that that's, that wasn't very nice. But all of the adults just were just looking down and silent. And I'm trying so hard not to cry because what I want to do is drop the spatula, say, have a nice time, everybody, run to my room, slam the door, lock it, and just throw myself on my bed and cry. I just I just felt such strong emotion at that point in time because here's this person who wanted to humiliate me in front of a house full of guests. He really didn't, he couldn't possibly have cared whether or not I spoke about my dad at that moment and what was going on with him. I didn't just randomly bring it up. Someone asked me, how is your dad doing? And I answered truthfully, he's doing okay. He's getting treatment. He, seem, he seems to be hanging in there just fine. He's going to all his appointments. You know, I've driven him to a couple appointments and things are going all right. But I'm not... I'm I, I'm I'm sad, you know. I'm I'm truly sad. I feel like I'm powerless. There's nothing I can do much about this. But other than that, I'm doing okay. It sounded like that. It was it was like that brief of a response, you know. It's difficult, but I'm doing okay, and he's doing okay for now. So, <laughs> but why? Why would why would the narcissistic person, the abuser? need to do that in front of all those people because it's such a huge opportunity to get some of that nice sticky sweet supply that they crave because their belly wants to have a belly full of it they want they just the way we want to have the food and the cake and ice cream okay we want the pizza the wings and the and the cake and ice cream at the party because that's the way we see that and we're hungry for that and it looks appetizing and delicious but to the abuser, my supply looks exactly as enticing and appetizing as all of that that's spread out on the table for all the guests. It's the truth. That's how they view your pain. They eat your pain. They can't get enough of your pain inside of them. They want your pain. I can't exaggerate. I, I mean, I'm, I can't stress it enough. The abuser will throw something like that out at you to hurt you in front of other people. And that doesn't mean they won't do it um, when it's just the two of you in a, in a space. And whoever the abuser is, it doesn't have to be your intimate partner but or your spouse. It can be any person at all who has a pattern of, an already established pattern of, I hurt you. And, you know, anybody, sibling, parent, you know, neighbor, coworker, someone from your church or your, your um, place of worship. So when we have these moments where they say these invalidating things to us, what was, let's take that apart for just a second. What was he invalidating? He was invalidating my emotions. He was invalidating my right to have anyone care about what's going on in my life with my family. He was invalidating my right to speak about something other than um, happy fun times. Okay. What he was making very clear to me when I, you know, after the guests leave, you have the argument, right? You say, you know what? 
You did that to me again. I've asked you to stop it. I've asked you not to do it. We've had dozens of conversations about this over many years. It has come up again and again and again and again. And I'm asking you if you could please think about my feelings before you say something like that in front of a whole bunch of people, because it hurts me. And then, then comes the, the typical thing. I didn't say anything wrong. You're so oversensitive. And then with certain abusers, the fact that you brought it up to them later and, you know, not in front of the kids or anything like that, but privately, when you say to them, that really, really injured me when you did that in front of a house full of guests. And um, I, I could just feel it hanging in the air. There was so much discomfort in, in the people that were around us. And when that happened, um, people were looking at me with sympathy and they were looking at you with um well, right now, the only word that I can come up with is disgust. And disgust is one of the core emotions. So is shame. I was feeling shame, which is a core emotion. I was also feeling disgust for what he did in front of these guests and, you know, at our child's birthday party. And then the other emotion, of course, um, excuse me, what I'm saying is you could read the disgust on the faces of the people who were present because they knew that something happened in that room at that moment and it happened in front of them and they were kind of used for it. And let's just pause for a moment to recognize that yes, when, when you're in a gathering, like the vignette that I just gave you, okay, we're in, we're in a, um, like a kitchen family room, part of a house. It's a birthday party. People are just talking and having a good time. The kids had been playing games and stuff and um, we're all indoors. It's winter, you know, and, and it was, um, I, I can't remember what kind of a day it was, but in upstate New York in the winter time, there's a pretty good chance that the, the weather is fairly, you know, icky. It's not the kind of place that you can have an outdoor birthday party. And so everybody's in close proximity. It's not a huge house, but the point that I'm making is when, when your, your significant other or whoever the person is that is going to choose this moment to invalidate you for the purpose of causing you to feel emotion, but also causing the people in the room, they want, they're trying to get all of those people to look at you as an invalid person who's being inappropriate. What this means is that the abuser does not mind exploiting every person in the room, mostly adults, okay? What they want is for the adults to hear this. They don't care so much about whether the kids do because they know you're not gonna be too troubled about what the kids think about a situation. It's the adult opinions when somebody is evaluating our behavior it's the adults that are the ones that we're concerned about whether or not they hear and how they respond. But what I can't stress this enough, the abuser is exploiting every adult in the room at that point because it's like, I want to hurt her and I'm using all of you because you're present and you're so convenient right now. This would have no value if you weren't here. If I just told her, you know what? Nobody wants to hear you say that without anybody here. It wouldn't mean anything. So I need all of you in the room. Thank you for all showing up to help me hurt my spouse. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This is just, thank you. Kudos. It's so great. They can't do it without the people present. Another example um, I'll give you this example, the invalidation, okay? Um, there is this really cool restaurant in the, in the closest city to where we live, and it's changed owners and it's changed names a few times, but one thing that is consistent about the place is the food is divine. And we went to this restaurant so many times, and I got in a rut, and I always ordered the peanut chicken, 
because it was, gosh, it is just wonderful. So what it was is a, a bed of seasoned spinach. It's served on a really hot plate, a, a bed of seasoned cooked spinach. And on top of that was a breaded chicken cutlet and it had a beautiful drizzle of the, of the richest peanut sauce. But it wasn't just peanut sauce. It had some sort of, it had something really special in it. And I don't know if it was some sort, some sort of liquor or something to create that really incredibly flavored sauce. But it was beyond delicious. And it was my, my absolute favorite thing to go out to dinner and have for a few years while it was on the menu. Even when they changed ownership, it stayed on the menu. And then we went there one time and it was no longer on the menu. Places had changed hands again. They got rid of that off the menu. So I was a little sad about that. But I was a little bit unsettled about something that had happened when we went to the restaurant and we got seated and the server came and wanted to take our order. And um, I looked at the menu only a very short time and my spouse was ready to order then. And so I came up with something really quick. I looked at it and I saw twin filet on there. And I didn't know that that meant filet mignon and that it was, it was butterflied. Okay. So it's twin filet. And I had no idea that that's what that was. I thought it was two pieces of fish and I just, anyone could make that mistake. I'm not going to beat myself up for making that mistake, but my spouse, when I asked for tartar sauce with it, I didn't know that it was a twin fillet of beef. And so I had no idea. And so when I said, I, um, I would actually like that with tartar sauce, if it's possible, you know, it came with a baked potato, it came with a vegetable and, um, and here I am asking for that. And my spouse went absolutely overboard with the laughter and invalidating me to the person who was our server saying to that young woman I can't believe she thinks that's fish I am so embarrassed right now how could anybody not know that that what they're ordering how could they not know that what they're ordering is a filet mignon and it's not fish. It says right there on the menu, if you read the print underneath it, it says what it is, and she thinks it's fish. And she's ordering something with tartar sauce. You would never order that, that dish with tartar sauce on it ever. This is ridiculous. And he just eviscerated me to this server. And the server was looking at me. If her words could have said anything, it would have been this, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that you're out for dinner with somebody who would do this to you. And I'm not kidding. I, I don't think I was imagining it. She was making that experience as nice for me as possible. And I think she was trying to put me at ease, to let me know, I don't think you're stupid. I don't think there's something horribly wrong with you. You made a little human mistake. But I heard about it on the way home. And I know that that invalidation would not have been so sweet and delicious for him. If, if I had just said it when the server wasn't there, if I had just said, oh, I'd like to have the twin filet with, you know, and I want to order it with um, tartar sauce he would have not gotten much supply out of that if there hadn't been that other person. So when we are, when we're being invalidated in, by the narcissistic person, the abuser, some people call them a narcissistic abuser. I don't differentiate a whole lot between narcissistic abuse and abuse because yes, there's, there is a person who may have, um, 
lots of factors that would be used in diagnosing narcissistic personality disorder, but we can't diagnose them unless we have um, diagnosing credentials. And I certainly do not hold diagnosing credentials. But when that person tells us that we're essentially um, stupid, unworthy, um, no one should really take us seriously or bother with us, and that whatever we're saying is ridiculous, what we ask for is ridiculous, what we say we need is ridiculous. It's um, we're just too much or we're not enough, but we're never just right. Um, all of this needs to have for extra bonus points, okay, to get sort of like a buy one, get one free on this. That goes into effect when there's one other person present there has to be one or more other people present while they're doing the damage in order for them to have all kinds of ding, 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 bells and whistles going off like the, like the end of the stock market, like the end of the business day and the beginning of the business day. That's what's going on inside of the abuser when they have somebody else present to triangulate you with. And if it's a whole room full of people, well, then that's no longer tri triangulating, you know, um, it's something altogether different, but exponentially more powerful to them. So the, the bigger the group of people that they can embarrass you in front of, the higher the points that they're earning for themselves in their imaginary artificial world where on the interior of them, they are the center of the universe and they have the entitlement to do it. And they do it because they want to. Let's remember that if a person is an abuser or if they're not an abuser, either way, if there's something that they don't like to do, it's highly unlikely that they're going to be doing whatever that thing that they don't like to do is, that they're going to engage in doing it all the time. If somebody engages in something very, very, very often, there's there's, there's a pretty good chance that they enjoy doing it. That's the way human beings work. It's a little bit redundant, what I'm saying. But people go to beaches and collect seashells and sea glass and surf and um, sit in lounge chairs with umbrellas or lay on beach blankets, walk, walk in the surf, go swimming, all this stuff. They do it because they want to. That's why they're there because they want to be there and they want to experience those things. Abusing a person is no different. They see that the way some people see the beach. It's awesome. There's so much opportunity there to do so many cool things. There's so many feelings that we get from going to the beach. I can never remember if it's negative or positive ions, but I, for some reason I want to say negative ions, I'm not sure. Some of you will automatically know the answer to that, but I know that when we go to an ocean beach, that there is there is a change in the ions because of the salt water. And that when we get near, even if we don't see the ocean, our, our mood can improve. We can, we can feel more engaged. We can feel excited. We can feel more alive. Um, when we're in the vicinity of the ocean, as soon as we can smell it. Um, I've had the experience of going to the Eastern seaboard of the United States, New England States many times. And there's just something that happens once you get in it close enough where you can't see the ocean yet, but you got the car windows down, you can smell it and the air is different. And it just, it just makes you feel amazing. And when, an abuser is in the vicinity of a group of people that they get to exploit and manipulate in order to harm you. It's almost the same feeling. It's like, oh, oh excitement. For some of them, it might be a feeling like when they are at a casino and they want to go play roulette. Real, real bad. They're not 
they're not in the casino because they feel they have an obligation and um it's it's just you know not where they want to be but they just go in no they're there because they want to be there because they get a payoff for being there and it's exciting it's an adrenaline rush it gets them it gets them really really going and they're getting feel good chemicals in the rain just for walking in the door and then it gets even more intense if they're playing a game or if they're you know playing the slot machines and it gets even more intense if they win some money. And when an abuser is engaging in abusing you through invalidation or any other tactic that they're using to abuse you, they're getting that, that, um, how should I say it? They're, they're, they're getting the dopamine, oxytocin and serotonin flowing in their body and it feels good to them. So, for, for a person who is prone to causing pain in another person, it can be just like when we're trauma bonded. And when we're trauma bonded, we get those, those releases of chemicals in our brain during certain actions that the abuser takes during a trauma bond. They're getting their brain chemicals released because the feel good chemicals, because they're getting a payoff for abusing you. They're getting power and control over you and they love that. But when we're being trauma bonded by them, we are getting some of that happening in our brain too and in our body and, and we get the feel good chemicals released. And that is part of why we can't break away. And so when we're invalidated over and 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 over again by an abuser, there's also the chemical release in the individuals. One is getting the chemical releases for doing the abuse and they are addicted to doing it because it feels good to them. They do it because they feel entitled to and they want to. The result is they feel good by knocking you down. And then when we are trying to get them to stop it and we voice that it hurt us, and we cannot stand it, it's intolerable. Sometimes the response that we will get when we tell them how awful it was for us, they'll put their arms around us and they'll say the sweetest things and they'll touch us in a certain way. They might begin to be very romantic and very sexual with us. And it is to trick our brain into believing that we still belong with them. This is part of the cycle of abuse that the trauma bond is created by, okay? I harm you. And then when you express that you've been harmed and I, you know, you're in pain, emotional, psychological, and even possibly physical pain. As soon as you let that be known to your abuser, they might come right up to you and just shower you with affection. And what is that doing that is just absolutely tricking your brain? It's not your fault. I'm, I can't stress that enough. It is not your fault. This is a person who is very adept at hurting you and using all kinds of coercive control practices on you. Because what are they? A really slick person who has an entire bag full of tricks that are very hard to name and define if you haven't been studying that, and most people don't. Most people are just so, so wrapped up in the survival aspect because that's all our system can do. Some of us just don't have the energy to be spending our time learning about what this is. We're already having our time used up with just trying to survive it. So it's not your fault. It's not your fault that you, that you got hooked in by a lying liar who lies. Anybody, any, the most intelligent person in the world would be hooked in by somebody doing that. Doesn't mean you're stupid, uh, bad, shameful, faulty, broken, or malfunctioning. All it means is that you cross paths with a highly adept a lying liar who lies and an abusing abuser who abuses. And so the different invalidation tactics um, yes, 
Yes, they, yes, it is a form of gaslighting for sure. Invalidating is a form of gaslighting. And all gaslighting is verbal, emotional, psychological abuse, unless it's what, um, what I refer to as uh, somatic gaslighting. I've never heard anybody else call it that, but I refer to somatic gaslighting as when the person invalidates you without using words. What they're using to invalidate you is their body language, where, let's say, for instance, you're out to dinner with another couple and or two couples, and you're all seated at the table, and it's your turn to talk, and you're speaking about something that you care about to these people, and your spouse is just sitting there going like this. And somebody else might say, what are you, why are you shaking your head? And that person might say, it's just because that never happened. But the, but the beginning of the gaslight was just simply body language. Just that look on their face, that, that I doubt it look. You know, the furrowed brow and the pursed lips and the one side of their face being, you know, like, like this, like, you know, one side of their mouth up, all of that is invalidating body language. And they might even pull away from you like this while you're, while you're saying what you're saying. Like they don't even want to be physically near you because you're so distasteful. Like, Ooh, Ooh, you know, you're just, you're just telling about an experience that you had and they want the people that are, are watching you and listening to you. They, they're trying to lead them to feel revulsion for you by changing their facial expression, their body, you know, position and um, shaking their head and doing whatever they have to do. Or, um, you know, some, sometimes they'll just get up and leave right in the middle of when you're speaking and you're with, you know, a couple other couples, they'll just get up and walk away. And that's them showing those people with a somatic gaslight is I can't even stand to be with her right now. I, I, I can't, I can't, nope, not, I'm not participating in this, which leaves the people at the table second guessing you. Is this, is this true? Is it so upsetting that he had to leave? Because she might be talking about like sometime, one time they were at a hotel and their room key didn't work and they had to go to the desk and get a different one. It might be something as benign as that and that person will just push their chair back dramatically and get up and walk away. And it's like, how, how is this offending you? But the point that they're making when they do it is they want the people that are near you, that are listening to you, to feel that you are invalid. You are somehow invalid. You shouldn't be believed. Your story has holes in it. Um, there's something, they should look at what you're saying and doing and what your emotions are, and they should say, uh-uh, no, no, bad, wrong, unacceptable, terrible person, don't want anything to do with this person. Even if you're not doing anything that matches their response, the whole point is that they're going to make you feel the way they want you to feel. And I'm going to speak like an abuser right now, the way the abuser is thinking on some, some level, whether it's conscious or subconscious, but here's what would be going on in front of you and, um, you know, the, the people that you're with, the person who is the abuser, this is what would be their inner dialogue, okay? Nobody wants to hear her. I hate when she talks. They should be paying attention to me. This is making me feel inferior or I don't, I don't like it that my, my partner speaks intelligently and I don't have that, com I don't have that level of comfort with people. Um, just, just ease and flow of dialogue doesn't come naturally to me. And I can't stand it that that person has no social awkwardness. I hate that. At least at that moment, I'm just saying, I'm not saying I never have social awkwardness. I'm just saying at that moment, no, I didn't have, you know, if that had if that scenario had happened, 
No, I wouldn't have been having social awkwardness. I'm very comfortable with these people. I'm just sharing stories, just like they're sharing stories. And we're all laughing and talking, having a great time, not poking fun at anybody, not pointing out any foibles that my spouse made or anything like that. And like I said, something as benign as, oh my gosh, our, we, you know, we just couldn't get our room key to work and we didn't know it wasn't, um, it was, it wasn't programmed and we had to take it back to the desk and have them do it because they basically gave us a dead room key. It was useless. And, um, you know, that's what we had to do. Just if that's part of the story and all of a sudden that person gets up and leaves, if it didn't have anything to do with embarrassing them or uh, maligning or slighting them or othering them or, or uh, making them feel marginalized or singled out or humiliated or shamed, if it had nothing to do with any of that, if it was just as benign of, of, of a discussion as can be, and then they get up and leave in a very dramatic way, it's because they want attention. It's just because they want attention. But if it makes the people that are with you question what you're saying and think maybe somehow you did something wrong, but they didn't get it, but she must have said something wrong, right? That's how they invalidate you. They just want people, it's good enough for people to just doubt you or to kind of second guess and wonder, are you saying something inappropriate? Because because he just had he just had a pretty big response to what she said. It's gaslighting everybody at the table when they do that. And so they do find value. They love that buy one, get one free deal on invalidation. And having other people witness you being invalidated, uh, being invalidated alone in the car on the way home from wherever you've been, it has value to them for certain, for absolutely certain. Yes, it'll it'll sound like this, like like what was in the article. They're so oversensitive, but they might even take it so far as to say, you know what? I think you should see somebody about this. You know. I did have a conversation with your sister and she mentioned that she thinks that your um, responses to things are, if the thing that happened is this big, your response is this big. And uh, she kind of hinted that she thinks that you should start seeing somebody. Start seeing somebody. What does that mean? You're, you're referring to a psychotherapist, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a licensed clinical social worker, uh, a licensed mental health counselor. Is that what you're referring to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, I think that, you know, it's not just me, it's other people too. Wanting you to be now feeling like, oh, other people are now talking about me. You've had di dialogues with other people about whether or not I am okay and whether or not I should be seeing someone professionally. Because of what now? If I invalidate you and you respond to it, even with interest, not, not rage or anger or any of that, just interest, like, I'm really curious, why did you need to do that to me in front of those people? Then comes the next invalidation, which is you're so oversensitive, you should probably get some help with that. That again, is them trying to make you feel something is wrong with you and that they didn't do anything inappropriate, but you have something wrong with your emotions and your psychology and your ability to understand what's happening in a room. And they want you to feel that you are completely and utterly invalid because they will begin to gaslight you to believe that you have something wrong with your thought patterns, with your emotions, with your feelings, with your ability to read the room. So it's, it's an old standby. It's a favorite. It will never go away. Every single abuser loves to use invalidation against a target person. And you might be the only one that gets this treatment from them in their life, but do keep in mind, 
that they are not only doing it to you when they're doing it in a group of people. They're using every single one of those people there. They're exploiting every single one of those people there and using them to be able to hurt you. And so their behavior is just, the only word I have for it is just gross. It's just gross behavior. It is not what people of love, light, truth, compassion, and human decency would ever engage in. It just isn't. But when we learn more about it, when we kind of take it apart on the table and understand what are the dynamics at play here? What does this behavior mean? What does it do to a person? And then how on earth do we recover from it? Well, in my, in my situation, it went on so long and it was so intense. It was so awful. Like even like I mentioned, I mentioned frequently in my videos, holiday gatherings, um, uh, you know, at a time where, you know, let's say for instance, you worked all day in the night before and the day before too, to make Thanksgiving wonderful for everybody that's coming to your house. And, and you've done over the top, amazing stuff to make it really pleasant for everybody to make that holiday really special. But the person who invalidates, the, the abuser who uses the invalidation technique, oh man, do they love something like Thanksgiving dinner. They absolutely love it. There is so much potential to exploit supply there. Every single guest there is supply for them. Every single thing that you say or do is supply for them. And it, it's just something where, for me, the answer the question, what, can, what on earth can we do about it? I stopped having holiday dinners. I stopped having people come over to the house. I stopped participating in holidays. And it was by my choice. It was my choice. It felt better to not have holidays at all than to go through the same pain and agony of being ripped apart the same way again and again and again and again. And it begins, and I mentioned peanuts a lot, but... When Lucy's holding the football and she tells Charlie Brown, you can trust me, go ahead, Chuck, get a running start. Come on, kick the football. And he does it in the very last second. One more time, she pulls it away and he falls on his butt. Well, I, I decided to stop getting a running start and kicking the football. I just don't anymore. I spend those days, and I'm not suggesting that anybody else does. That is not what I'm saying. But I do spend those days lavishing self-care on myself, doing things. If I can go out and enjoy some nature, if I can be outdoors, if I can plan ahead for some activity for myself that I'm going to do that I love, that is a replacement activity for working myself to, practically to death. And then knowing that that night I'm going to be going to bed with the only part that's really reverberating in my head still is how sickeningly I was treated in front of the guests when they were there. And I said, no more, no more. Some of you might say, well, that's a bit extreme, Lynn. Why, why did you have to shut it all down? Because it, it really depends on how extreme the abuser is, how bad their addiction to your pain is. And we have chemical addictions for sure. Uh, but there are also process addictions. And I think that abusers are having both. They're addicted to the chemical releases in their brain, but they're also having um, the addiction to just being able to feel powerful, being able to um, dissociate from their actual life for a while and go into that kind of disconnected from self, disconnected from others, just, just kind of dissociated. That's what dissociation is, is disconnection from self and others in the environment. And to just bask for a while in their, in their, um, well, in their, in their subconscious, I would think it would be safe to say they're not fully conscious of how awful they feel, how, how neglected they felt maybe in their childhood or, you know, in their adolescent years or whatever part of their life. But they seem to have a really, really deeply rooted need to exploit each and every holiday when the people are around. 
in order to be able to get supply. But the most precious supply to them comes from the person they target the most. That's the person whose pain matters the most to them. And they will stop at nothing to make sure that you feel some. Then afterwards, always the same thing. I didn't do that to you. What are you talking about? No, I told everybody how delicious the food was and how you slaved all day and the night before and you were making pies the day before. I told everybody that I was so appreciative of everything that you did. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, you did. But you're leaving out the part where you embarrassed and humiliated me in front of everyone because because I um I I I you know might have had um left the stuffing in the oven too long and it got a little too brown around the edges. And he had to point out to everybody that um that I screwed up. And they will if you point that out to them that they did that to you, that they invalidated you in front of everyone, they publicly, you know, in front of front of a group of people, they humiliated you and they shamed you. And then later, when they their review of the whole day is going to be, I was nothing but wonderful to you. What why are you making up a story that I that I uh criticized you? Maybe you need to see somebody. Maybe this is functional. Maybe you need to see somebody in behavioral health. I think maybe somebody could help you because you seem to take everything way too personally. More invalidation. You're just not going to get it right with this person. And so my, my way of remedying this for myself is to say, I'm going to have emotional distance from you. I'm going to have physical distance from you. And if you if you do not like that you don't get to have holidays with me anymore and you don't get to live in the same space as me anymore, then if you didn't like that when you were told what needed to be changed in order for me to stay, you could have made the choice to change that behavior but you opted out. And so if they opt out, if you say, these are my boundaries, you may not speak to me this way anymore. You may not do this to me anymore. This hurts me when you do this. I no longer tolerate it. I know what it's called. I've been to counseling. I am, might've gone to domestic violence counseling um, and they will accept you as a client in domestic violence counseling even if the person has never landed blows on you before, because they consider psychological and emotional and verbal abuse, financial abuse, sexual abuse, spiritual abuse, bullying, all of these things, cyber abuse, legal abuse, all of that is domestic violence. If you're not sure about what constitutes domestic violence, please visit thehotline.org. They have a wealth of information for you there. And it explains the cycle of violence. It explains every form of violence that people can experience. And you will be um, you will be given very, very clear information that is reliable information. And yes, verbal, emotional, psychological abuse is 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 violence. It is a form of violence. And the abuser, if you ever say that to them, they will probably argue with you until you just give up and walk away. They will argue with you that there's nothing, nothing violent about what they do to you. They'll say, oh, oh, now it's violent to disagree with you? Somebody just disagrees with you, now they're violent? Now they're, now they're um, a domestic abuser? Really? Okay. This is whatever comes out of you is going to be invalidated. And that's how you know that you're with an abuser. And we don't look at the individual thing that they do. We look at the patterns. When we're deciding if they're an abuser, we're looking at the patterns. And if this is a one-off, it's not a pattern. And they might be just having a bad day or a bad moment and maybe chose to do something completely cruel and insensitive to you one time.
But if it happens a second time, it's a pattern. If it's happened for, <laughs> for 40 years, you can, you can take it to the bank that that is an abuser and that they are abusing you. Why? Because they feel entitled to and they want to. And so that they can gain power and control over you. Because that's how they get themselves to feel what they believe is feeling good. But if it comes at the cost of someone else's pride, their self-esteem, their nervous system being healthy, their emotions being healthy, their feelings being healthy, their biology being healthy, their relationships being healthy, everything about them, if it comes at a cost of them not being healthy anymore, then how valuable was it? How valuable was that behavior that they were doing? Because eventually, um, an abuser is very similar to cancer. It, it destroys, cancer destroys the host. And there's an old expression, cancer is stupid because it destroys the person who is who is keeping it alive and therefore it dies too. And I think of domestic violence and any forms of abuse as very similar to what cancer does. If you're destroying the person that you're getting supply from, um, I had a very, very, very learned and accomplished and excellent um, couples counselor that we went to. And the way he phrased it was, when you stay with an abuser, a few different scenarios are going to happen. One is you're going to get very, very sick. One is that you're going to get very sick and die. One is that you could commit suicide. And one is that you could um, be killed by them. And he said, if you're with a true abuser, and he said to me right in front of my spouse, if you are with a true abuser and you are, those are the things that could happen to you if you stay in this relationship. And he said to me, I want you to understand you're free to do whatever you want. But if you stay in relationship with this person, those things could be what happened to you. And I took that very, very seriously. And I walked out of that appointment knowing I got my answer. I finally got someone to take it all apart, examine it, ask each person, did you do that? Did you? Yes. Do you feel remorse? Nope. Okay, then. And we just kept going and going and going. Every allegation that I made, was they were asked, did you do that? The answer was, yeah, I did. Do you find anything wrong with that? Nope. But I regret doing it. We talked about this yesterday, the difference between regret and remorse. I heard the word regret again and again and again in eight months of counseling. And then finally was given the response that I, you know, the summary that came at the end, which was don't walk away from this person, run. Get out, get away from it. It's going to kill you. So that's how we end up sometimes. I'm not saying anybody else should do as I've done. Each and every single person has autonomy and they have the right to do what their system needs, what their relationship is all about. No one outside of your relationship can tell you whether or not you should ever stop tolerate another situation of invalidation or any other form of verbal, emotional, psychological abuse or any other form of abuse at all. That is for each autonomous individual to decide. Unless someone is landing blows on you, and if someone is physically harming you, it's a whole different ballgame. Okay. 
If someone's physically harming you or your children or your pets, then it's go time. It's go time. You have to get away. But the rest, if it's anything other than physical abuse or sexual abuse, you can work it out by going to counseling and making a plan that works for you. And always remember, the resource hotline.org is always avail available to you 24-7. Okay, so I hope that you found value in this talk. I hope you have a really good and peaceful day today. Please remember self-care is never, ever selfish and that you are infinitely worthy of your own trauma recovery. Again, please like, subscribe, share, um, put comments in the comments section, hit the notification bell. And if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one certified trauma recovery coaching sessions with me, Lynn Boutier, please reach out via my website, which is lynnboutier.com. You can go to my email, lynn at lynnboutier.com, or you can call me 716-994-3052. I would love to get a call from you. I almost always return my calls within 48 hours. If you don't hear back from me within 48 hours, please call again. It's unusual if that happens, but I want you to call back. If 48 hours goes by and you haven't heard from me, you're not being a pest, okay? Sometimes sometimes messages get don't get picked up or something like that, but it's not because you don't matter, okay? It's because sometimes there's, there's a, a slip up because I'm human and I don't have a support staff that works with me. I don't have a secretary. So... <laughs> I hope to see you in the future. Enjoy your day. Please take good care of your system's needs today because you did listen to some traumatic things that I was speaking about. And please, please, please lavish the most wonderful self-care on yourself for the rest of the day. See you next time, everyone. Bye.